All right, we're recording. So hi you guys and welcome to my channel. I'm back with a new video and you guys requested me to check out the most dangerous female narcos in history of time. I just woke up. It's like 8 a.m. So I'm ready to start my day with this video. So I'm not gonna ramble. Let's get straight into it. Literally, let's go. Sometimes, looks can be really deceiving. She was around high school age when she became an assassin. She lived six years on the run. Every turf war would result in a massacre. Just blood? No. When we talk about narcos, we usually think of people like Pablo Escobar or El Chapo, ruthless men surrounded by a fleet of loyal, aggressive soldiers. But what if I told you some of the most dangerous narcos in South America were actually women? I'm talking of the women who stood by dangerous drug barons through their most volatile moments. The ones who ran whole divisions of the drug trade and the ones who were ruthless enough to overthrow and run the cartels themselves. If you're surprised, that's fair. After all, it's men who are usually associated with war. Zeynep Salvi said of women, like life, peace begins with women. We are the first to forge lines of alliance and collaborate across conflict divides. But what happens when women take arms? Let's look at some of the most dangerous female narcos in history. This is La Catrina, or Maria Guadalupe Lopez Esquivel. She led a notorious hit squad that left a bloodbath behind everywhere they went. Maria had humble beginnings. She was the daughter of a rancher and a housewife. She grew up in the city of Tepel Catepec, but she knew she didn't want to stay there for too long. She hated school and she never wanted to pursue a regular life. In 2017, she ran off from home and started living with a member of the Yalisco, new generation cartel in Agualia. Maria had fallen in love with Miguel Fernandez, who was a high ranking narcotics classic. Baron, but Maria didn't join the cartel out of love for a man. She did so out of love for fame and money. Mm. Within months, she climbed up the cartel ranks and started making the big bucks. And as soon as she did so, she started showing it on social media too. Before long, she took the name La Catrina, a hats off to the famous day of the dead festival figure. La Catrina became a part of a gang of Sicarius, young pretty women soldiers who used their beauty and innocent looks to lure and kill members from the rival gangs. But as Maria wanted to continue climbing the ranks, she soon became the leader of her team. Then she became the commander of a hit squad. She and her squad were responsible for several assassinations, extortions, and kidnapping. In October 2017, Mexican police were executing a warrant at a home when they were ambushed by La Catrina squad. It was a massacre. After they killed 13 officers and injured many others, the squad set two police cars on fire. The message was clear. They wanted war with the police and La Catrina felt invincible. But the officers heard her voice when she was giving orders to kill. Then they knew she was responsible for the attack and they knew they had to get to her. On January 10, 2020, the National Guard received a tip about La Catrina's location. They didn't waste any time. The officers surrounded the squad's safe house and a violent shootout ensued. Except this time, it was the squad that took the hit. Tranquila, mija, ya viene el helicóptero por ti. Ya viene el helicóptero. Tranquila, hija, tranquila. Vas a estar bien. But La Catrina had been shot in the jugular. She was taken to the helicopter while all her men were put down on their knees and cuffed. But age 21, Maria Lopez died inside the helicopter after she lost a lot of blood. 21? Easy come, easy go. Deal. This is Sandra Avia Beltran. She led a life filled of crime and tumultuous relationships. And it all culminated with one huge move that brought her down. Sandra didn't really have a chance at a normal life. She was 
practically born into the Sinaloa cartel. Her mother's family were notorious heroin smugglers. Her father, Alfonso Alvia Quintero, was the brother of the Guadalajara cartel leader, Rafael Caro Quintero. Sandra grew up in the 1960s, watching cold-blooded men do transactions and tough negotiations, and resort to violence whenever words weren't convincing enough. This was the language she knew from a very young age. By 13, she was her dad's official money counter. And at the same age, she witnessed a massive shootout. Sandra went on to study journalism at a prestigious university, but her colleagues remember her as a very withdrawn, always suspecting person. However, this was just her school persona. When she was 21, Sandra started dating Armando Carrillo Fuentes, the boss of the Juarez cartel. Around the same time, she What did I say? Classic, classic. She became a prominent figure in the Sinaloa cartel, overseeing illegal substance shipments to the US. Her relationship with Fuentes didn't last a long time, but she would have many more. And her two marriages would be more tactical than romantic, but her husbands were ex-police commanders turned traffickers. These men knew the ins and outs of the Mexican police world, and their insights helped her dodge the law and become a huge figure when it came to substance smuggling. Ironically, both of her husbands were stabbed to death by hired assassins. Another one of her rumored lovers was El Chapo himself. No one knows just how romantic their relationship was, but one thing's for certain. They were once very close, and Sandra was head of public relations for the Sinaloa cartel. Then Sandra had yet another tumultuous affair. Sheesh. Juan Diego Espinosa Ramirez, also called the Tiger. The Tiger had strong connections to the Norte del Valle cartel in Colombia. This was just the open door she needed. Colombia. Through Sandra, Colombian and Mexican cartels were now united and she was making more money for Sinaloa than ever before. Is in 2001, the U.S. seized a tuna fishing boat transporting nine tons of white snow. Imagine how many more actually came into the country before the DEA finally caught on to them. After this incident, Sandra got her nickname, the Queen of the Pacific. Hmm. She also got hundreds of officers on her tail, working hard to arrest her and bring down the Sinaloa cartel. She lived six years on the run and suffered the kidnapping of her son as a result of her violent means of negotiation. Finally, in 2007, she was arrested. Tu nombre, por favor. Sandra Avila Bertrand. De donde es originaria? Tijuana, Baja California. When the officer asked her what business she was in, she said clothing. Even though she was convicted and sent to prison for life, she remained adamant that she shouldn't be there. Then she complained about insects in her cell and arranged for prime conditions, food, alcohol, and cigarettes to her liking. When she was denied restaurant-made food, she claimed her basic rights were being violated. In 2015, she was released and is now living in Guadalajara. This is Jocelyn Alejandra Nino. She was a young cartel assassin with a horroring story. Jocelyn's life began like many others. She was born in the 1990s to a relatively poor family in the Tamaulipas in northeastern Mexico. It's unclear whether her family has ties to the local cartels or whether their financial situation pushed her towards the illegal side of work. But from a very young age, Jocelyn became an active member of the Gulf Cartel. In fact, she was around high school age when she became I mean, an assassin usually, for them. This is around the... You're not coming from the best uh, places when you're ending up in things like that. It's not like you have money. You know? Time she earned her nickname, not excuse me, La really. Flaca. In La English, Flaca. this means the skinny one. As you can see, she was quite a tiny person compared to the huge firearm she was holding. But in Mexican tradition, La Flaca is also a female skeleton saint, Our Lady of Holy Death, who is sometimes depicted in artwork Spooky. for the popular Day of the Dead festival. Mm -hmm. You might think, hey, it sounds pretty badass to be an assassin at age 18, but there's nothing cool about it. First of all, La Flaca took many lives under the instruction 
of her even more ruthless bosses. Second of all, life in the cartel is not that glorious. It's not known exactly how La Flaca climbed ranks and made it to assassins so soon, but most girls like her, young, petite girls from impoverished backgrounds, started out by being lookouts for the gang or even illegal street workers. They get treated and mistreated in every way imaginable before they gain some authority. And even then, it's not all fame and money. This all became all too clear in January 2015. On January 5th that year, someone leaked this picture of La Flaca to Valor por Tamaulipas, a citizen journalist page meant specifically for organized crime leaks. The picture quickly made it to Facebook and Twitter. People were fascinated by this small young woman with a friendly smile. It stood in pretty stark contrast to her bulletproof vest and big firearm. Who was she? Was she a big shot in the gang or just a foot soldier? Another thing that stood out and earned this photo a lot of attention was its background. Indeed, La Flaca's room didn't look anything like the luxurious villas we see in Narcos. Is this the true reality of cartel living? Is it really worth the risk of losing your life? And is it really worth taking a life if you're gonna live in poverty anyway? It seems like only the very few top dogs get to live luxuriously, while their employees only ruin their lives for them. La Flaca's picture was a window into the tragic reality of Mexican cartels. The photo got thousands of likes online, but this was the beginning of the end for Jocelyn. She was a member of the Los Ciclones gang, led by Angel Eduardo Prado Rodriguez, AKA Ciclone 7. At the time, they were at war with another gang, Los Metros. By leaking photos of the Ciclones members, Los Matros weakened the cartel and exposed these people, making them easy targets for the police as well as the rival gangs. And La Flaca was indeed a very easy target. Ciclone 7 sent her to fight Los Matros from Rio Bravo, which was Los Matros' territory. So every day there was a death sentence for her, and eventually she met a truly gruesome end. On April 13, 2015, police officers discovered her dismembered body inside a freezer in a parking lot in Matamoros, Tamaulipas. Throughout the day, the officers kept finding more body pieces scattered across town. Some were inside plastic bags. La Flaca was only identified thanks to her distinctive tattoo. She'd written Nino on her arm. This was her family name, but it also meant child. It's a sad irony that this was what was left of her. She really was a child when she died, somewhere between her late teens and early 20s. And to make things even more tragic, the autopsy confirmed that she had also been tortured first, as Los Matros were trying to get information about Los Ciclones, other members. La Flaca was killed together with another woman and a man. In a final gruesome act, Los Matros took pictures of their dismembered bodies and posted them on social media with the caption, this will happen to all the filthy who support Los Ciclones. Keep sending these fucking assholes. Violence only leads to violence and the Mexican drug cartels are no peaceful place. This is Melissa Margarita Calderon Olleda, AKA La China. She was the commander of a cartel army that was so violent it shocked her soldiers, her male colleagues, and her boyfriends. Sometimes, looks can be really deceiving. Melissa Olleda was born on August 12, 1984, in Mexico. By the time she was 20, she had already decided her fate. She was going to be a cartel leader, and she was going to do whatever she needed to get there. Melissa joined the Sinaloa cartel back in 2005, more precisely, the Damaso cartel, a subdivision of the Sinaloa, she was ruthless and ambitious, and she didn't care that most of the criminals around her were men. She could be just as aggressive, and when it came in handy, she also used her feminine charm as a way to climb up the ranks. By 2008, La China was commander of the armed unit, and while she was commander, the rate of crime in the area went up several times. She had a thirst for blood that was shocking, even to the violent criminals in her gang. She would kill cops, kidnap people for extortion, and dismember enemies from rival gangs. That's 
clip was something from America. That had nothing to do with this. They have random clips that have nothing to do with this. Imagine that. <laughs> Lachina and her unit were responsible for at least 178 deaths. Whenever her men would have a successful mission, leaving bodies behind, that is, she would reward them with big bags of white powder. But in 2014, things took a turn for the worse when the Damaso cartel leader El Grande killed Melissa's boyfriend, Eric. This hit was meant as a message to Melissa. Classic, Her time guys. as army commander was over. You might be excused for thinking that this was the cold shower she needed. Perhaps she thought she'd better throw away her gun and return home. But violence is the only language cartel members understand. Now, Melissa was now certain she wanted blood for blood. She rallied 300 cartel soldiers to her side and started a new cartel, Las Fuerzas, together with her brand new boyfriend, Hector Pedro Camarino Gomez. He called himself El Chino to go hand in hand with La China, but even El Chino would find his girlfriend too violent. Imagine if Latina was a violent, bloodthirsty commander during peaceful war times. How was she after a waged war against Damaso? Every turf war would result in a massacre. And as the police were now on her tail, she would keep moving from town to town. One day, she sent one of her Sicarios to get a new car for another journey. He arranged for a couple of vendors to deliver the car to Melissa. When they did, she killed them just to avoid paying for the car. The Sicario was shocked and threatened La China to go to the police. That's when she cut off his forearms, shot him in the head, and buried him in her usual mass grave. Oh my God. This was her own man. El Chino saw this and he couldn't take her violence anymore. Imagine being too violent for a cartel member. El Chino fled and ran straight to the police. Only they could give him protection against La China and her bloody cartel. And since he wanted to stay alive, he also tipped the police about Melissa's location. On September 20th, 2015, La China was arrested at the Cabo San Lucas International Airport. She was just trying to flee the state. She will spend the rest of her life in prison. This is La Jefe. La Jefe means the boss. And for the Mexican cartel world, it really seems like Anadina Ariano Fili is the boss. Anadina was born on April 12, 1961 in Sinaloa into a family of traffickers. And perhaps unsurprisingly, her relatives became her role models. Anadina's older brother worked for their uncle, notorious drug lord and Guadalajara cartel boss, Miguel Angel Fili Gallardo. Anadina got a bachelor's degree in accounting but she didn't use this to exit the cartel life. In fact, she used it to their advantage. And Adina advised her six brothers and helped them with money laundering as the Tijuana cartel's financial advisor. But in 1989, the Guadalajara cartel was destroyed and most of its members were arrested or killed. So a few positions of power were up for grabs. Anita started a heated relationship with Armando Lopez who was very close friends with El Chapo. Classic, you but guys. two of Anadina's older brothers assassinated Armando as they didn't agree with their relationship. Yeah, that's what you do if you don't like your sister's boyfriend. But this only motivated Anadina to rise to the top of the cartel and show her brothers who's boss. So when El Chuy, the cartel's financial boss, died in 2000, she took over his position. Eventually, she did gain the upper hand over her brothers. One of them, Eduardo, was arrested in 2008. This is when she became the leader of the Tijuana cartel. But Anadina, or La Jefe, is very different from all the women we discussed today. She very much embodies Zainab Salvi's quote, which is pretty strange for a cartel boss. Since the 1990s, Anadina has been known for her rational, methodical approaches to business and for her peaceful negotiations. She never swears and she never orders assassinations. And her focus is on bribes and the illegal substance trade. Sure, she's not exactly a saint, but her quiet, discreet approach has saved her skin and her sons all these years. She remains in the shadows 
and she's not a priority for the DEA or the Mexican authorities, even though she is La Jefe and leads one of the biggest Mexican cartels to this day. To this day? Let us know what you think about these cases down in the comments section. And before you go, so she and another woman that got released, they're still alive. The majority of the video died. It's crazy. Uh, I'm thinking like, usually when I see these things, they seem, you know, obviously super organized and um, tightened together. So... To me, like, I understand, obviously, money is a drag, but I will never understand what they say about fame. It's a drag. So when I see the more low-key ones, you know, that just want the money, don't want to be seen, I understand that more than people that say that I want to be seen and famous. Because uh, to me, nothing good comes with that. And it ruins for your organization. But this is horrible, though. Uh, so many people get killed, so many innocent people get killed. And you can see that they don't value life. They, they value money. Money and power over a human life. Um, yeah, These people, you know, seem to come from poor conditions or already, uh, you know, have family members that are in the business. So, I mean, there's usually the route that goes uh, with it. Some people leave it, but I understand that's difficult. It's crazy though. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Comment down below. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. I thought it was interesting. And if you made it to the end, thank you. And hopefully I'll see you in another video. Bye.